All right, Romans chapter 1 be our starting place tonight, Romans chapter number 1. If you don't like to retain God in your knowledge, God gives you over to a reprobate mind. Every, every day we see evidence that our, our country, border to border, coast to coast, given over to reprobate mind. Try to, try to follow this bit of insanity here. A student at the Indiana University of Pennsylvania was kicked out of a class on Christianity for believing that there are only two genders. Just let that sink in a little bit. Student Lake Engel was suspended from a class on Christianity after he argued that there are only two genders. After viewing a talk by transgender ex-pastor Paula Stone Williams, a.k.a. sicko, Engel raised his hand, that's a threatening gesture, and claimed that biologists believe that there are only two genders. That's not a claim. Bio there, there are biologists that believe there are only two genders. So the news media is in on this with the system. That's not an argument. That's a statement. His statement was not a claim. It was a fact. Amen. So they're all perverted. Engel was immediately kicked out of class by the professor and asked not to return. Now pending an administrative investigation, Engel, a singer, a senior, may not graduate in May. In a letter, Indiana University of Pennsylvania provost Timothy Moreland says that on top of Engel's suspension from the classroom, he will be required to apologize to the class. Engel will then be forced to listen to his peers describe how his comments made them feel. And there it is. If you're a God-rejecting, Bible-denying humanist, Facts don't matter. What matters is how you feel. Well, how do you feel about how you feel, about how he made you feel? Did you, did you feel what he felt when he felt what you felt? Did you all feel a bunch of sickos? Lake will write an apology to the professor, if he wants to graduate, which specifically addresses each of the disrespectful behaviors described above. I didn't read of any. Demonstrating ability to take responsibility for inappropriate behavior. What's inappropriate behavior? Disagreeing with the brainwashing propaganda is inappropriate behavior on the college campus. And uh, inappropriate behavior which has significantly damaged the learning environment of the course. In other words, we're trying to brainwash all these kids and you presented an alternative view that wasn't perverted and that was a hindrance to the course. Engel will, or Lake will be required to explain the importance of an atmosphere of safety for an educational environment. You know, if... If disagreeing with a pervert makes people unsafe, us preachers be in prison in 10 years, if that's where we're going. He has to acknowledge, um, let's see, how his, uh, how his class behavior significantly damaged the classroom atmosphere and explain how we will demonstrate respect for the professor, the course material, and all fellow students at each remaining class session. Every time he comes back to class, he's going to have to go through the thing again. On 3.8, Lake will begin class with an apology for his behavior, and then listen in silence as the professor and any student who wishes to speak shares how he or she felt during Lake's disrespectful and disruptive outbursts. This is, this is a, an institution of higher learning. It's a sewer of lower depravity. Yeah. 
That's what it is. My professor is violating my First Amendment rights because of the fact that my views and ideology is different from hers, Engel told Fox News in a comment, so she took it on herself to silence and embarrass me, to bully me for speaking up in class. Well, no, no, young man, I'm sorry. You, you don't have a First Amendment right. It's their classroom. It's her class. She can throw you out. If you don't knuckle under the propaganda, you don't have a First Amendment right to disagree with the professor and still pass the class. Which is why the schools are turning the country into the reprobate situation that it is. It's my firm belief that every human being has the freedom and right to identify, dress, and represent oneself as they see fit, Engel added. I, I think this is all an attempt to silence my views personally because they contradict the ones she pushes in class so evidently. He's just trying to say what he thinks they want to say. It's like, how do you prove you're not a racist? How do you prove you're not a sexist? How do you prove? You can't prove the, the opposite of these charges that people are throwing at you. You're hateful. How do you prove you're not hateful? Yeah. Indiana University of Pennsylvania is a public research university located in Indiana, Pennsylvania. Surprisingly enough, Allison Downey, the professor for Engel's course, get this, claims expertise in Christian feminist theology. You know what Christian feminist theology is? It's camel marshmallow bicycle. It's, it's Pluto rock. Toad frog. There is no such thing as Christian feminist theology. Amen. You can't put those three words together unless you're a moron. There's no such thing. Engel, uh, she's the uh, faculty member of uh, Indiana University of Pennsylvania's Women's and Gender Studies program. Want to bet 10 bucks they don't have a men's gender study program? They're sexist. Engel says that this incident has only strengthened his motivation to become a professor. When you see that kind of misuse of intellectual power, you want to be the person that comes back and does it responsibly and with morals, Engel said. Instead of being the purveyor of your ideology, you can be an educator. So this guy signs up for a class that he thinks is about Christianity. And he ends up having to sit there and watch videos made by reprobate sex perverts. Yep, yes, sir. And when he offers a scientific view of gender, he's thrown out of the class because it makes people feel unsafe. You know what that is? That's the future intelligentsia of your country. Well, you know, the people that did, you know, the, that, that voted, you know, the people that voted for Hillary, they're the college educated people. They're the smart ones. No, they're the perverts. Yeah, right. <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't smart. This is just weird. Yeah. Now, there's another one. Uh, I won't read it to you because it just, it's, they arrested a woman this week. A decade ago, she was sentenced to do some prison time because she, she married her son. Got out, the laws have changed, so now she has, they found out she married her daughter. And it's against the law, and they're going to put her in prison for marrying her daughter because it violates uh, laws against incense. I, wait a minute, the Supreme Court said... Come on. If the Supreme Court said there is no definition of marriage between a man and a woman, how can you outlaw that? What did I say? <laughs> Incense? I, I, I'm incensed. Whether they have incense in the house or not, it's, it's in, incest. 
is, is it, it's against the law. How can it be against the law if the Supreme Court has ruled you can't define marriage by the Bible? So if she can get herself a good ACLU lawyer, she can take that thing all the way to the Supreme Court, and they're, if they're going to be consistent, if, you, if a man can marry a man, why can't a woman marry her son? Now, I'm not for any of it. I'm just telling you, our country is so far down the toilet that these things, that, no, nobody would have thought of doing something like this. I went to college for years, so did you. There weren't classes like this. Nobody cared how you felt. Here's the material, learn it, pass the test, or you flunk. We don't care how you feel. Amen. Professor, may I say something? Sure, what do you want to say? Well, there, you know, bi some bi biologists say there's only two genders, male and female. Get out. Get out. Why? We don't feel safe having someone like you in here. You're dangerous. Where would you get the idea that someone who believed there are only two genders was dangerous? Television. I mean, you can't have a, cl a class on Christian feminism and have a Christian in there. <laughs> this thing's so fouled up. It is so fouled up. We're just going to stand on the deck of this ship and preach and preach and preach till it sinks. And we'll sit on a lifeboat and preach and preach and preach until, until the Lord comes. All right, Romans chapter number one. Romans chapter one. Christian feminist theology. <laughs> wow. Verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Seems appropriate. Verse 25, we change the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. We can read a story like that every single day. Romans 1, it's right on time. Being filled with all unrighteousness. Fornication, we covered that. Wickedness, we covered that. Covetousness, we covered that. Maliciousness. That's a big word. Tonight's word, boys and girls, is maliciousness. Mal is a prefix meaning bad or badly, wrong or wrongly, imperfect, defective, like maladjusted, malformed, malpractice, malfunctioning, maliciousness. It's not good. It's not good. Malice is extreme enmity in one's heart. It's a disposition to injure others without cause from mere personal gratification or from a spirit of revenge. Malice is unprovoked anger, hatred, or spite. Basically, it's a desire to see others suffer or delight in their misfortunes. The powerful inflict injury on the weak because they can. That's malice. The weak wish the infliction of evil upon the powerful, even though they can't bring it to pass. That's malice. Malice is not malice once it's acted upon. The action proves the existence of the malice, but one can have malice in their heart, whether they're ever able to act upon it or not. God looks on the heart, and he sees those that would do evil deeds to others, or would enjoy if others had evil deeds done to them. He views those the same as persons who carry out the evil deeds because they can. All right, let's pray together. Father, help us tonight, please. We don't want to be malicious one time in our life. God, you put it right on par with adultery and idolatry, and we sure don't want to displease you in this way. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Two places, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Ezekiel 33 and 2 Peter chapter 3. Ezekiel 33 and 2 Peter chapter number 3. Have you ever 
for an hour or for a day or for an extended period of time thought, I hope he gets what's coming to him. That's malice. I hope God gives me a chance to let that fella have it. That's malice. God said, God said, in my eyes, it's just like committing adultery. In my eyes, it's just like bowing down to an idol. Ezekiel 33, God is speaking here about the wicked who have rejected him. And he says in verse 11, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why would ye die, O house of Israel? God would, God would chasten them because he had to. God would punish them because he had to. But it was not God's desire. God had no evil, God had no unrighteous feeling in his heart toward even the wicked who were sinning against him. In 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now these people, these, these famous people upheld by the world as, as wonderful, these famous people die all the time. And when, when a man, uh, like the one that, that we referenced earlier tonight, when a man who has spent his life mocking God, when a man who has spent his life criticizing people who believe the word of God, when that man dies and drops into hell, God is not happy about it. God is not pleased. It brings God no satisfaction whatsoever. If that man, the last day of his life, after spending his entire life fighting against God, if that man, in a moment of fear, in a moment of awakening and realization, had called on the Lord from his heart, God would have saved that man. If you don't believe it, look at that thief on the cross. That's God. Lord, help us. Lord, help us. Not to respond to the crumpled up gospel tract with a something that comes from our heart that says, well, I hope God gives you what you got coming. Amen. We should not hope that God gives any lost sinner what they have coming. God doesn't hope that. When someone curses you or, or makes an obscene gesture or some sort of thing like that when you're preaching the word of God, you shouldn't respond with, I, you know, I hope you fall off your motorcycle. Hope God, you know, I, I, well, I hope God teach you a lesson. Why, why would we want people to break their arms? Why would we want people to, to, to slide down a highway and tear their flesh all to pieces? That's not God's heart. That's my self-love responding to someone who doesn't love me as much as I love myself. I'm not angry with that man because he didn't receive Christ. I'm angry with that man because he didn't take the tract I gave him because I, I'm a great soul winner. I'm not angry because that man didn't trust Jesus as his Savior. I'm angry because he insulted me and called me dirty names and, and used bad language against me. And I'm out here serving God. I deserve better than that. I'm not responding as a Christian. I'm responding with malice because... My love for me has not been shared by the person who is cursing me. I hope you get it. Turn your Bible to Colossians chapter number 3. Colossians chapter 3. I try to not just read the Bible and not just learn what the Bible says. I, I really want to make the application of the Scripture to my life, to myself as I read it. Colossians 3 and verse number 8. But now, now that you're saved, verse 1, if you then be risen with Christ, but now ye also put off all these, 
anger. Question. When's the last time you got angry? How long did it take you to put it off? How long do you think God intended you to wait before you put it off? Till you were finished enjoying it to the full? Till you f were finished acting upon it the way you felt you, you were justified to act upon it? God doesn't ask that human beings not get angry. He says, put it off. Why are we wearing anger as though it's a righteous thing? Why are we wearing anger as though I, I am just in my anger because I... <laughs> I'm angry because someone didn't treat me the way I believe I should be treated because I deserve better. Because I'm, I'm great. Everybody should know that. And if they don't, I will be angry. Lord says, how about put off the anger because I've been watching you since you were born and you're not all that great. Yeah. Anger, wrath. Now there's my anger in action. Or malice. Anger, wrath, malice. I'm, I'm, I'm not wealthy, so I can't, I can't lash out and get away with it. So I'll just hope something happens to him. I'm not powerful, so I can't settle the score. I'll just hope someone else does. I have no place of authority, so I can't make that person suffer. So I'll just hope God or man brings some suffering his way. Why? Because someone on this planet did not recognize my lordship. And they deserve to suffer for it. My wife, I cannot believe my wife did that to me. Well, who are you? Well, the Bible says she's supposed to, yeah, I know, I know. And you're supposed to be like Christ. My husband, I'll tell you, I, I hope, I, I, I'm, I'm just praying God will get him for, does that sound like Jesus' prayers? You better hope Jesus never gets to, into the malice business. Because he wants to hurt you or he wants you hurt, you're going to get hurt. So how long, how long should I wear my anger before I put it off when God said put it off? How long should I wear my wrath when God said put it off? How long should I wear my malice when God said put it off? Well, I'm just going to, I'll just, just leave me alone. I'll, I'll, I'll simmer down here in a few days. That, what translation are you reading? Put away anger in a few days. Put away malice in a couple of months. God should take it off. It doesn't, it doesn't fit you. Your Christian doesn't fit you. Blasphemy. You know, if I get malice in my heart before long, I'm going to be doing some things and saying some things that are not in line with with a believer, the Christian, I'll become a blasphemer. Filthy communication out of your mouth. You know, brother, you get anger in your heart and wrath in your heart. You will speak to your wife in the privacy of your home in ways you would be so ashamed to hear the people you go to church with hear you speak to your wife. And some is premeditated. You got your feelings hurt in the morning, your feelings hurt the evening before, and all day at work you just thought, when I get home, I'm going to tell her this. When I get home, I'm going to say that. When I get home, I'm going to, oh, oh, that'll be a good one. That'll really get her. I got an idea. Why don't you put that stuff off? Amen. You take that stuff off. You can't, you, you can't unload on your boss. You'd lose your job. You can't unload on the police officer. He might fine you. So you're just going to go home and unload on your wife. Big man. Big man. You know what would be better to do? Take it off. Amen. Amen. Put away that anger, that wrath, that malice. Before you do something, uh, before something filthy comes out of your mouth. Amen. 
children out of line, you ought to discipline those children. But it ought, nothing ought to come out of your mouth in your, in your home toward your husband, your wife, your children that you couldn't say right here in front of everybody else as a Christian. You know all that stuff comes out? Because it's in our heart. People say, well, I didn't mean to say that. Oh, you did. You, you meant it. You just didn't want it to come out kind of in the, in the situation where it did or, you, or for it to happen like it did. These people sit around. You know, they get to the Internet now. They sit on there. I'd like to shoot the president. Well, I don't doubt that you would, but I would advise you to put that malice away. I hope all the Democrats get AIDS and die. Well, God doesn't. Why don't you put that off? Why are you wearing that? There's enough, there's enough hate in this world without Christians participating in it. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Here's another one. Ephesians chapter number 4. You know what malice is? You know the gospel? Do you know the gospel? You know a lot about the Bible? You know a lot about the Bible? You know how to pray? You know how to pray? You know how to edify somebody? You know what malice is? Well, wait till I see that guy. I can't wait till I see that guy. Next time I see that guy, I'm going to let that guy have it. Really? That's what you're looking forward to. The next time you see a brother in Christ, you're just going to unload your malice on him. And you're going to think about it for a day, for two days, for three days, for four days, for five days. Well, praise the Lord. Man, let's just all, next Sunday will be, will be Malice Sunday. We'll just all come in here and just unload on each other. Boy, what a time that'll be. Well, I don't want the whole church to do it. I just want, I just want to do it. Well, what if everybody just decides they want to do it on the same Sunday? Just, just. Everybody comes in and, and, and I got a grievance with you and you got a grievance with her and she's got a grievance with it and that family's got a grievance with that family. Who doesn't? You want to dig up something? We could all dig up something. You know what malice is? I'm, I'm going to park right there. Not on the blessings, not on the benefits, not on the praises, not on the answer to prayer, not on the souls that are being one to Christ. No, no, no. Somebody forgot that I belong on the throne. It might be my wife, it might be my husband, it might be my pastor, it might be my best friend. They need to be reminded. I belong on that throne. And then malice, oh, malice gets in that heart. Ephesians 4, watch this. Verse 30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. That, that's true of me, praise God. Anybody else here saved? Well, then that's true of you. See, I, I want to rejoice that I'm sealed to the day of redemption, but it'd be okay if your seal broke. <laughs> and God just kind of lets you slip out of Christ. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Now, look, this, this is really brilliant how the Holy Spirit wrote this. Bitterness, I'm not going to express it. Wrath, I'm not going to act on it. Anger, I'm going to settle down. Clamor, I'm going to keep quiet. Evil speaking, I, there's some things I was going to say, but I'm not going to say them now. Okay, that's good. Be put away from you. With all malice. See, if we don't get rid of what made us want to do those things, it's going to come out again sooner or later. Well, as soon as my husband gets home, I am going to let him have it. I'm, he, this is it. I've taken all I can take. I'm going to let him have it. And then he pulls in. Uh, no, no, I better not. He, he, might, he might do something and, and I might get hurt. And so, but I, I'll tell you, if he does that one more time. See, so what I do, I, I stop the outward expression. But I don't root out the inward motivation and desire it's just going to happen again, and again, and again, and again. Good. You know when these uh, fire crews come out and deal with these, these uh, woods fires and brush fires? I know a little something about this. But they, uh, they say the fire's all out, there's no flames anywhere. And the smoke's all down, there's hardly any smoke anywhere. 
You know what they do? They go around and look for hot spots where that fire has gone down under the ground. It gets down there in the roots of the palmettos, or it gets down there in the, in the lighter knots of those pine trees down under the surface. And what they do, they walk around, and they're not looking for flames. They're not looking for smoke. They're, they're feeling for heat. And they pour all kinds of water on something that's not burning, but it's simmering down under the surface. Because as soon as they turn their back and walk away, that thing can start all up again. Here goes another forest fire. You know what people do in their home? You know what people do in their friendships? You know what people do in their church? They get the flames under control and they get the thing to stop smoking. But they never put out the heat down under the surface. Brother, it don't matter if you go home tonight and you don't fight with your wife and you were going to. If you don't get that malice out of your heart, you will. You might not fight with her tonight, but you're going to fight with her again. You understand what the Lord says here? Don't do this, 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 this. And then take care of what causes it. That's the malice. I want somebody, if the only suffering is just they get to get a good tongue lashing from me. They deserve it. Does anybody here want God to start dealing with deserve? I do not want God to deal with me on the basis of deserve. Anybody? How about grace? How about, yeah, how about mercy? How about long suffering? Well, he deserves it. <laughs> no, God, not, not me from you. Him from me. I don't, I, don't want, I don't want to deal with deserve. All right, 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. Children. Oh, children. <laughs> they'll, they'll try you, won't they? They'll test you. 1 Corinthians 14. Watch this. Verse 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding. Kids don't get it. They don't get it. The danger of this, the danger of that. They're just having fun, just going through life. How be it in malice be ye children, but understanding be men. Now we have these things all the time around here at the church house. Um, back in the back, um, you, think, you think they're just some children running around back there. But in fact, in fact, on any given Sunday, it might be World War II, it might be cowboys and Indians, it, it might be, you know, uh, who knows what. But about 20 minutes into everybody having a good time, somebody comes in through one of the doors. Ah, he hit me with a stick and it hurt! <laughs> Pretty much every week. And it hurts. Who did it? Bobby, and I'm going to kill him. <laughs> no, you're not going to kill him. Well, I hate him. I'm never going to talk to him again. Okay, come on over here. Let's, let's put some ice on it. No, ice is cold. <laughs> well, it's going to swell up. I'm going to put some ice on it. No, I don't want ice on it. Okay, what do you want? I'm going to go back out and play. With who? With the kid that just whacked you with a stick. <laughs> you know what's amazing about these kids? Really, I mean, they, they hurt each other. And they're over it in 10 minutes. The ones they were never going to speak to again, they're speaking to before they, oh, wait, it's time to go, we got to go. I don't want to go, I want to stay and play. You said you never wanted to play with him again. <laughs> well, that was 10 minutes ago. I'm over it. You know what the Lord said? Get over it as quick as your kids do. Get over it as quick as your children do. But he hurt me. Yeah, that's what happens when you play with sticks. You get hurt. <laughs> it happens you play with grown-ups. <laughs> you get hurt. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will really hurt me. <laughs> you know what the Lord said? Get over it quick, as quick as the children do on the playground. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians 5. Verse 
1 Corinthians 5. You ever read about the Inquisition? That's malice, man. Sit around and think up those tortures. It's malicious. You read about this stuff these ISIS people do? Who can think up stuff like that? It's malice. Malice. People just sitting around thinking about ways to hurt other people. Bad business. God said don't ever get caught up in that. 1 Corinthians 5, verse number 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Isn't that great? Come on, we, we're not coming once, once a year to have a feast day. Every single day of our lives, we're feasting on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Isn't it great to be saved Amen. every day, all day, every day? Why wouldn't you be saved sincerely and truthfully instead of being saved maliciously and wickedly? Let's don't just be saved. Let's let Christ get everything out of our heart and everything out of our life that's part of what we brought over with us from when we weren't saved. Amen. Get it out. Root it out. Get rid of it. Throw it away. You don't need it. Don't need it. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Christians must have a problem with this. It's all through the New Testament. Titus chapter 3. I've always figured the more times God mentions something, the more likely I am to do it. I mean, come on, think about that. Why is it in there over and over and over again? God, let, let, let's see this. I'm going to put the whole New Testament in here just so somebody can say, well, it's not all for us. Okay, I'll give you a pen knife. You can take out what's not, and, but that's, that's not our purpose tonight. See that right there? That's the whole New Testament. It's for, for God to speak to Christians, that's not a lot of speaking from God to man for thousands of years. There it is right there. He could have said something new and different every verse. If this is all God was going to say to us and he says something five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times, must be something we have a hard time getting through our heads. <laughs> By that you say, I'm going to take you for an x-ray, son. I don't know how anybody has such a thick skull. <laughs> I didn't know what that meant, but now I do. Because God feels that way about me. I can't get it in your head. I keep trying to get this in your head, and I can't get it through your thick skull. Titus chapter 3. Lost my place showing you how thick the New Testament was there. Titus chapter 3, verse number 3. For we ourselves also were, were, that word is in the past tense, were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Amen. See that? So I used to be lost, now I'm saved. That's easy to say, because it doesn't require anything. How about, I used to be malicious, now I'm kind. That's harder to say because you can't fake that. People know if you're kind or if you're not kind. I'm saved, well I don't know if he's saved or not, he says he is, that's all I got to go on. But if somebody says, you know what, I'm kind. If you're not kind and you say I'm kind, everybody knows you're not kind. <laughs> but the verse is really even more impressive. But after the kindness of love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Now think about this. God is love 
That's easy. But God loves him? Well, now that, that really steps it up a level or two, doesn't it? God is kind. Well, of course he is. But God's kind to that guy. God's kind to her. That, that really changes everything. So, it's one thing for me to say, you know, God's kind, I'm kind. God is love, I, I, I've got some love in my heart too. But if, if love only extends and kindness only extends to people that recognize my majesty, that's not God's kindness and it's not God's love. Because he makes his sun to shine on the just and on the unjust, makes his rain to fall on the, on the saved and the unsaved. There's two farmers in one little town out in, in Nebraska, and they're growing corn, believe it or not, growing corn out there in Nebraska. And the one guy's a saved man, reads his Bible every night, prays for his meals, and teaches kids about Jesus Christ. And, uh, and the one next door, um, he ran his wife off. He's, he's got a filthy mind. He sits up every night looking at pornography on the internet. And when the sun comes up every morning, God shines that sun on both men's fields. And when the saved man prays for rain, the rain hits on that man's acreage and the no good man's acreage because God is kind. And God is loving. And if my kindness only extends to people that I feel deserve it, I'm still living like I used to live before I got saved. I'm still living in malice. I'm saved, but I hadn't changed my address. Lord help us, man, we get out there on, on those streets witnessing and preaching, go down that rescue mission and we walk in and the guys are sitting there and you, you start preaching to them and start telling them about Jesus and they start falling asleep and then it, it gets over and they want to come up and argue with you and all of a sudden that, that longing desire to tell them about Christ starts getting intermingled with the desire to tell them, why don't you shut your mouth, man, you good for nothing bum. You know why they went from a soul I care about to being a good-for-nothing bum? Because they disrespected me. <laughs> See? It, it, I'm not upset that they didn't trust Christ as their Savior. I'm upset that they didn't recognize the, the, the great teaching I just gave them. How can you disagree with me? You know what? I'm living in malice. Oh, I know the truth. I can preach the truth. And if you receive the truth, I'll kneel down there with you and lead you to Christ. But if you come up here and argue with me, I'll tell you how sorry you are. <laughs> What's well, tough, isn't it? It's really, it's really tough. It's tough to get down in that heart and get that heart in the right place. First Peter, First Peter chapter 2. I had this thought the other night. I had this thought the other night. What if your adversary downtown is going to be there every Friday afternoon until every one of us has no malice whatsoever toward her? What if God just has her there to expose how easily provoked we are? I've given you the gospel three times and that's it. I'm done with you. You can just burn for all I care. You well, God doesn't feel that way. He's not willing they should perish. <laughs> First Peter, uh, First Peter, chapter two. I can't read it to you because I'm in Second Peter, chapter one. First Peter two. Here we go, verse one. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies, and envies, and all evil speakings. We'll, we'll get to some of those. There's a lot in Romans 1. <laughs> a lot there. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Now, now watch this. I'm up, here, I'm up here teaching the Bible, and 
let's just say some man on the second row just gets up and walks away while I'm, while I'm <laughs> preaching the Bible. And I, I think in my heart, how dare that man do that to me? Preaching God's word. Back there, his arms folded like you ain't tell me nothing. <laughs> see this, see this word? It's sincere milk. I'm told to desire the sincere milk of the word. You know what that means? God thinks I'm a baby. It doesn't matter how spiritual I think I am or how far down the road think I, I think I am. If I read 1 Peter 2, I read it. It tells me to desire the sincere milk of the word. God said, when it comes to being a Christian, you don't even have teeth yet. You're crawling. How about that? But here, look at side by side. Wherefore, laying aside all malice, verse 2, desire the sincere milk of the word. Here's what happens. When I get sour in my heart toward Hector, I don't want to read the Bible. I want to think about him. When I get, when I get bitter in my heart toward my wife, I don't want to read the Bible because it's going to say things like, husbands love your wives. So I don't want to read it. I just want to stew on that thing and think about how I'm going to... You know, they're side by side. Your desire to see someone else hurt cancels out your desire for God's Word. Malice and bitterness and anger and envy, those things will kill your spiritual appetite. I, I, was, I was on an airplane, uh, tried to witness the woman next to me, and she was a, a professor, literature professor at a college. And I said, wow, how about that? So we started talking about uh, Shakespeare and Keats and Twain and all this, all this sort of thing. And she said, I, 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 have, I really have trouble with my male students. She said, I, I get my female students interested. I can't get my male students interested. And I said, you giving them both the same books to read? And she said, yeah, why? I said, because the boys don't want to read The Great Gatsby. They couldn't care less about flappers and, and miniskirts and all that stuff. They want to read about revenge. You've got to give the boys the Count of Monte Cristo. You've got to give the boys. Listen, the, these, that guy goes to, to they put him in that prison house, and that guy sits there for decades, and the only thing that keeps him alive is I'm going to get out of this prison, and I'm going to search the world over till I find the man that took my girlfriend, and I am going to kill him. And guys love those kind of books. Because, well, I mean, no, who reads a book anymore? What they want to do, they want to go to a two-hour movie. And the bad guy hurts the good guy's girlfriend, and he just he starts lifting weights and pumping iron, and he learns how to dodge 20 machine guns uh, firing at him at one time. And at the end of the movie, there he is face to face with a bad guy, and he could shoot him in the head, but he throws the gun down. He gives him 24 roundhouse kicks to the jaw before finally punching him out and walking away satisfied. That's, men like that stuff. Revenge. Do you know what? Every hour you spend wanting revenge or wanting to even the score or wanting to give someone the last little piece of your mind is an hour you're not wanting the Word of God. You can't desire malice and desire the sincere milk of the Word. Your appetite to get even with somebody will take away your appetite for the Word of God. Just, it's just, it's a Bible fact. There it is right there in the Word of God. Third John, third John, chapter, well, any chapter will do. Third John, and it's not just the people you, you think have a problem with this. It could be a church leader. Everybody has, everybody has a problem with this. All right, verse 8. 
We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words. And not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Now, let me ask you something about your personal fellowship and your impersonal fellowship. It might be your face-to-face -face fellowship or it might be your social media fellowship. I don't want to have any fellowship with a, with a person who in the hallways and in the parking lots and on the internet is speaking malicious words against my brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to read it. I don't want to be, I don't want to be a part of it. There's, there's places in your life where you reap what you sow, and there's places in your life where you don't reap what you sow. I have never written a pamphlet, an article, a booklet, preached a sermon, put a post on, online, sent a con I don't spend any of my time attacking saved born again people, preachers, not preachers. If a man believes salvation by grace through faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ and he disagrees with me on everything else, I'm leaving him alone. What, what is it that makes you can't wait to get home and sit on your computer and, and devote your life to tearing down every saved minister in the world who doesn't recognize your glory? I mean, that's what you're upset about. You, you're not going to stake your life to a, to a position on a gap theory. You're not going to stake your life to a position on the, on the restoration of Israel before or after the, the rapture uh, and before or after the revelation of the Antichrist. Uh, okay, have a position. Rent a building. Win some people to the Lord. Teach your position. Leave everybody else alone. It doesn't make you important to comment on somebody's website about how wrong they are. And you know what? It didn't satisfy your, your malice because tomorrow night you'll be on there doing it again. Here's some guy got 150 people. He's won to Christ. And he's teaching them the Bible. He's teaching them to go out and win people to Christ. You haven't won anybody to Christ in 10 years. Not one person in a church that you brought there, but you're going to sit on the internet and tell everybody in the world how he's not as right as you are. Don't you get that out of your heart? Whole world's going to hell, and all you got to do is try to tear down other Christians and other preachers. Why don't you go win somebody to Jesus? Malice. Malice in the heart. I'm going to show everybody he's no good, and that'll take him down a notch or two. Why did God call you to take saved people down a notch or two? The only person I can find in the Bible we're supposed to take down a notch or two is ourself. <laughs> take you down a notch or two. Well, I'll tell you that preacher, I get, 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 why don't you come over? I got, I got some things. There's some things I know about him you don't know. You just you need to come on over, and I'll tell you. You know, anybody ever, ever says that to you? Invite the preacher over at the same time. <laughs> Why not? I mean, let him in on it. He needs to hear it more than the other church members do. He's that messed up. Just have him over. Just have a big, big supper. Okay, he's got something to say. Oh, no, no. I, oh, yeah, you said, you said you want to tell me some stuff about the preacher. Well, no, no, no. No. <laughs> You must have misunderstood me. You liar. You liar. <laughs> you going to add to it by lying? We could talk about Jesus. But if malice gets in our heart, we won't talk bad about somebody else. We could talk about the blessings of God and answers to prayer and joy in our life. But if malice gets in our heart, we want people to know how we've been wronged. You know what the Lord said? That's tipping toward a reprobate mind. 
How can that be? Well, because if I'm desiring malice, I'm not desiring the sincere milk of the word. If I'm not putting off the anger and the wrath and the bitterness and the clamor and the malice that God told me to put off, then I'm walking around wearing the garments of the flesh. How's that going to help your marriage? How's it going to help your friendships? How's it going to help your relationship with Jesus Christ? Tonight I could, I could easily call to mind many things that people have done to me, said about me, done to my wife, my children. I could, I could, a lot of those things. But what if they start bringing up all the failures in my life, all the shortcomings in my life? How would that help either of us? You want to dwell on all that? You want to think about all that? You want to thirst for revenge you could never have? People like those books and they like those movies because they're not real. That's never going to happen. You're never going to find a treasure and buy a ship and sail around the world and kill everybody that did you wrong and live happily ever after. So why not just think about Jesus? Why not just re rejoice in the Lord? You're not going to settle every score. Some of them don't need to be settled. You live long enough, you find out half the people you thought did you wrong, did you right. You just didn't have sense enough to know it. Well, praise the Lord. Diatrophies, malicious words. Somebody, somebody, you, you on that Facebook and all that other stuff, somebody sends something to you and they got bad words on there about their preacher or your preacher or some preacher or their, their brother in Christ or your brother in Christ. That'd be, that'd be it for me. Say, so you're done. You're done. I don't want anything else from you. I don't want one more, one more picture of your dog eating his birthday cake. You're, you're done. You're done. I don't want one more recipe for, for potato salad. You're done. You're done. I don't need to fellowship with people who've got malice in their heart. I don't need any fellowship people speaking malicious words. I go, I go to these churches every now and then somebody, uh, they'll, they'll come up to me and say, can I talk to you about the pastor? No. No. You want to tell me how good he is? You want to tell me what a blessing is? You want to tell me how to help your family? No, there, there are just some things I think he's doing I don't think she'd be doing. Go get him. Or keep walking. I don't, I don't need any fellowship with people who got malice in their heart. Don't need it. Don't need it. Now, I don't want to be one of those people. I don't want to have a heart full of malice. <laughs> it's not easy. You ought to see this stuff. I mean, every single day, every day. Every day we get a letter from somebody. You did this wrong. You said this wrong. You're wrong about this verse. You're wrong about that verse. You're probably not even saved. You're a tool of the devil. The only way that could bother you is if you thought you were something. I know I'm not a servant of the devil. I know I'm not ever wrong. <laughs> Look, if, if the stuff's not true, it's not true. And if it is true, fix it. But you think everybody in the world is going to listen to everything you preach and like it and not feel that God wants them to tell you you're wrong? <laughs> I mean, come on. It's either that or go on the church's visitation program. They're not going to go on visitation. They're not going to tell a lost person how to get saved, so they may as well just stay on the computer and tell another Christian why he's wrong. <laughs> That's what people do. You can't let that stuff get in your heart. Because then you start sending that stuff right back at them. It's a fact. Get that malice out of there. Get that desire to see the other person suffer, the desire to see God straighten out that other person. You know, you, know, you know what you mean. You want God to spank them. God, you need to chasten that child of yours because he's not doing right. 
Well, you hadn't been doing right for 20 years. It didn't bother you until it was you. <laughs> All right, everybody. You, we got it. We, we on, on the same page here. Just, just keep that desire to settle the score out of your heart because you can never settle the score. Can't do it. And God's not out to settle scores. He's out to forgive and save and bless and help. Hallelujah. All right, Father, thank you for the Bible. Sure is easier to preach against sodomites and adulterers and people that do the things that we don't do. But it's tough when it's something that's so much a part of seemingly all of our lives. Help us, God, get that bitterness out. Help us, God, get that anger, wrath, resentment, malice, clamor. Help us, God, get all those things out of our lives as often as we need to over and over again. We thank you for helping us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.